नमस्ते सरस्वते देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेषा शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिणे वाचा कल्पतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पति पावेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद So the structure that is seen in the Gita is something which is discerned by the readers and the commentators. So technically speaking, or structurally speaking, the from the 13th chapter onwards till the 18th chapter, it is called as the Jnana section of the Gita. Now. If we consider what Krishna is doing, that it's if we consider there's the path of karma yoga, there's the path of kyan yoga, there's the path of bhakti yoga. So the way Krishna is developing the thought, it's from karma yoga to bhakti yoga in chapters one to six. Then there's a the discussion of bhakti yoga from chapters seven to twelve, and then it is. From Jnana Yoga to Bhakti Yoga in chapters 13 to 18. So Krishna talks about Jnana Yoga, but he concludes the discussion in Bhakti Yoga. Now, why does Krishna talk about Jnana Yoga? As I said, that Krishna doesn't start by saying thinking that, or the discussion Gita doesn't start with the with the plan that we'll be discussing all these parts. It is the questions that Arjuna gets. And Arjuna asks those questions. So now, at the start of the 30th chapter, Arjuna brings in certain terms. And he asks for the meanings of those terms. So when he asks for their meanings, those terms are, at least some of them, for example, Arjuna uses six broad terms. He uses Kshetra and Kshetra Gyan. Then he uses Prakriti and Purusha. And he uses Jnana and Genya. So he asks the meaning of these six terms. Now when he's asking the meaning of these six terms, at least these two terms have never been mentioned. Even Gaya is not mentioned. Now Prakriti, Parishya, Jnana, these are natural terms in the Sanskrit conversation, Sanskrit vocabulary. So, why is Arjuna suddenly asking the terms who, which have not been discussed before? And one reason is because he is focused on understanding Krishna's worldview. See, knowledge, whenever we, when our knowledge increases, it is not that 
um, say if I have some old knowledge and then I have some new knowledge. Now if these two knowledges are existing in just two different head spaces without much connection then then that doesn't bring like a holistic a wholeness or integrity uh, there has to be we can't just have two units of information for them to be useful our old knowledge has to be in some way connected with the new knowledge so maybe the new knowledge builds on the older knowledge that means say like if we study something about physics in first year of engineering then you study something more about say physics in second year so we are building on the previous knowledge now sometimes it may be that the relationship with new knowledge and old knowledge this is one possibility it is a linear build up but sometimes it may also be that the old the new knowledge is like a bigger world view within which the old knowledge fits in so that means it is not so much a build up but it is a bigger picture which accommodates the smaller picture now sometimes it could also be that the new knowledge that we get it can be that the new knowledge involves say rejection of our some other old knowledge so learning to some extent also involves a certain level of unlearning so we unlearn some things and then we learn the link between the old and the new so for so this especially happens in say our view of politics or our cycle our opinions about people i may think this person is a rude person and then after some time we'll okay then maybe this person is not really rude i i maybe was hasty in my judgment yes this person sometimes behaves rudely but maybe something is going on there like so in one sense when we gain some new knowledge we try to fit it or somehow bring it in connection in harmony not just connection with our previous knowledge so for example if to take a simple example say if doctor uh, if you are sick and we go to a doctor and the doctor prescribes some antibiotics and say we have heard that that antibiotic has a lot of side effects now because of that we think i don't know to take this but then the doctor may say yeah okay there are these side effects but you know they happen in these these cases especially but in these cases they don't happen so much or they happen we have this kind of medicine to counter it so what is happening is we may still the previous knowledge was not entirely wrong it was more incomplete than incorrect so what is happening uh, that arjuna lives in a spiritual culture and by living in that spiritual culture he has also heard about the gyana world yeah the gyana world view and he has heard different sages talk about that world view within which they have talked about these terms so when arjuna is asking about the terms when he is asking about terms his interest is not in dictionary meanings of those terms the bhagavad gita is rather the it's spoken on the battlefield that he is not interested in knowing the what is the definition of this term and what is the definition of that term the terms point to the underlying world view that how does that world view fit into what krishna has taught now and that's why when arjuna asks very specific questions krishna's answers are not focused so much 
a specific explanation of the terms. Krishna is focusing on not technical dictionary meanings, but the essential implication, the essential worldview that is there. And he addresses that worldview. So, let's with that understanding, let's move forward. See, one of the challenges in understanding the Bhagavad Gita is that the Bhagavad Gita is spoken at a particular time. And each time, so while well, the Gita, you can say Gita's message is two aspects to it. One is it is timeless, but it is also timely. Timely means that it is spoken at a particular time. So we could put it, there is a universal aspect of the Gita's message and there is a contextual aspect. So say for example, now we are discussing the Gita. So I may give some examples from say cricket. But maybe thousand years down the line and the game cricket has become extinct. And at that time, if somebody wants to understand what is going on over here, what is this cricket thing, and what is the sixer, what is the boundary, what is all this? So they will not understand this. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are certain contextual aspects. Now some of the contextual aspects may be important for understanding the core concept. But some of them may not be contextual but they may be a part of what the audience already knows. Say, say for example, now if we teach the Bhagavad Gita, we in our temples we have the Bhagavad Gita course. So we call it discover yourself, journey of self discovery, essence of Bhagavad Gita, whatever name we give it. Now when we teach this course, at that time, what do we do? We talk about the existence of God, for example. Now the Gita doesn't have to talk about the existence of God because that is not the issue for Arjuna, isn't it? He doesn't doubt the existence of God. In fact, it is not that Krishna actually proves the existence of the soul so much. Krishna just explains the characteristics of the soul. And based on explaining the characteristics of the soul, the point is that the soul is different from the body and the soul is eternal. So what happens is that there is the Gita knowledge and for us to reach the Gita knowledge we may get to need get we may need some pre-Gita knowledge <laughs> isn't it <laughs> so for example let's take of at least three concepts the existence or not just ex existence existence and the rationale rationale means the rational basis so rational is the adjective, rational is the noun. So soul, God, hmm. karma, none of these are actually in any way uh, logically proven by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Because that Arjuna does not need. But we need those things. Is this point clear that so that the, so in the contextual knowledge, the contextual may be sometimes irrelevant to us, but sometimes it may be relevant. <coughs> so what is contextually assumed? Say for example, Krishna tells Arjuna to fight. Mm -hmm. Now that is contextual. Is that relevant for us? <coughs> Take a physical fight against someone. That is not relevant for us. That is contextual but not relevant. Now, there can be a metaphorical fight against our lower desires, against our minds, impurities. That is fair enough. But the Gita also talks about literal fight. That is contextual. Now, it is important because it is part of the Gita. But it is not relevant for us. But some things are more relevant than others. So, now in the Sankhya worldview, there are certain concepts which are more relevant than others. So we will be focusing on those concepts. This is the entire worldview in itself. So Krishna will explain how the Bhakti worldview actually integrates the Sankhya worldview. So Sankhya and Jnana, 
these terms are sometimes used interchangeably not always but many times so literally sankhya comes from the word sankhya sankhya means what number or count so it can be as a as a noun it means number as a verb it means count so basically what the sankhya world view does is it analyzes the world and breaks it da down into its component elements and here in 13th chapter krishna will talk about the 24 elements that are a part of the sankhya world view so the idea is when we break some things down break something down into its components we can get a better understanding of it but in sankhya the purpose of breaking down in some ways science is also similar science also involves breaking down isn't it that in science what we do is okay what is the okay i see this bar okay it is made up of a particular material it is made up of atoms and molecules atoms and molecules are made of subatomic particles we are breaking down so while in in method there are some similarities between sankhya and science that both are centered primarily on the study of matter by so we take the material world matter and we try to break it down now in science the purpose of breaking down is in one sense power power to control so for example if you understand how the laws of law of gravity works how the laws of motion work then we can tap that power and we can create technology we can try to bend the world to our will in sankhya however the study the breaking down is done for its power to let go it is basically detachment traditionally gyana and vairagya are always associated together that the more we get gyana about the nature of the world the more we will develop vairagya the more we will become detached now so sankhya is the same as gyana and this leads to vairagya unfortunately science it doesn't lead to vairagya it leads to rag <laughs> it leads to the opposite it doesn't have to but it does lead that way because overall focus of science is uh, largely it's to develop technology and the idea of technology is to gain greater control so for example we have developed more and more forms of entertainment so what is that by that we develop more and more attachment to material things now those material things can be physical things or they can also be depictions of physical things but the rag increases so so the so in one sense sankhya and science their method is similar but their purpose is not just dissimilar but you can say it's opposite now of course science is sophisticated in its own way science involves mathematics that is an integral part of the language of science or the methodology of science sankhya does not involve mathematics so much so there are significant differences but overall in terms of method there are broad similarities so what is Krish what arjuna wants to know about this world view and so krishna starts explaining briefly about the terms but then he goes on to focus on the world view so this is a little technical section of the chapter in fact third chapter is the most technical chapter in the entire gita so i will skip over many of the technicalities i'll focus on key principles but let's 
look at this. Let's look at the first term and how he explains it. Shri Bhagavan Vacha. Shri Bhagavan Vacha. So he says, Idam Shariram. This body of Arjuna. Oh, count here. What is it? Kshetra Itya Abhidiyate. It is known to be the Kshetra. Idam Shariram Kaunteya Idam Shariram Kaunteya Shetram Itya Bhidiyate Shetram Itya Bhidiyate And then Etad Yo Vetti All this one who knows that Vetti is to know Tam Prahu That is known as Kshetragya Tadvidha Iti Tadvidha That one who knows the body is the Kshetragya Etad yo vetti tam prahu Etad yo vetti tam prahu Kshetragya iti tad vidaha Kshetragya iti tad vidaha So essentially Krishna is broadly equating Kshetra with the body and Kshetragya with the soul So Kshetra is the body and Kshetragya is a soul. Now, why not just use Atma and Sharira? It could be used, but these words have a specific implication to them. See, Kshetra means field. So, it refers to the field of control, the field of influence. So, see, the Krishna will talk about two other terms afterwards. He will talk about Purusha and Prakriti. So Prakriti refers to nature at large. Hmm? Whereas Kshetra refers to the part of nature in our control. Partially. We never have full control. That say for example, right now, I am writing over here. So I have some control over my fingers. I have some control over the tablet on which I am writing. So, so, so this, my hands are my, they are part of my body. That is my kshetra. But what you are writing in your books, that is not my kshetra. That is your kshetra. But your hands are also a part of prakriti. So prakriti, is like the entire material nature. Prakriti is the entire nature, nature and within that each one of us has some Kshetra. Now, some of us may have a bigger Kshetra, some of us may have a smaller Kshetra. So the President of America has a much bigger Kshetra than say a poor person living in a hut in somewhere in Bengal. Say. So, but that person also has some control. So we all have some influence. So Kshetra refers to the body, but in principle what is referring to is the area of control that we have. So our primary area of control is our body and based on where the body is born, based on the talents within the body, other things, the influence may radiate outwards. So Krishna talks about first Kshetra and Kshetra. Okay. Now of course, in both of these cases, the, so the Purusha is soul, but actually the Purusha is also the super soul. We know our body, Krishna also knows our body. In the next verse, Krishna will say that there is the super soul, also there is another knower in the body. There are broadly two knowers, the soul and the super soul. Now, after having described this, we will talk about Purusha and Prakriti later. I am just talking about these right now. Then Krishna will go into <coughs> Jnana and Gnaya. So here there is a subtle difference. When Krishna uses the word, normally you think of Jnana as knowledge. Isn't it? But Krishna uses it more in terms of the process of gaining knowledge. Process or parameters um, mm, 
you could put it this way it is the process of gaining knowledge or the virtues needed to keep gaining knowledge. See, the idea here is when Krishna is talking about knowledge, it is not uh, in the Vedic context, what is the purpose of jnana? Liberation. Liberation, vairagya, detachment, liberation. Now, while we are in the material world, detachment is something which has to constantly keep being done isn't it that again and again temptations will come and again and again we have to keep saying no to temptations so there can be temptations there can be distractions which are also a form of temptation uh, but generally temptations convey some pleasure distraction may not even be pleasurable it's like a loud noise there's nothing enjoyable out of the loud noise but it's distracting so what happens is in the Vedic context, jnana knowledge, the idea of knowledge, it might convey a one-time thing. It's say, I have, in our childhood, we learned the maths tables, we learned the alphabet A, B, C, D, we learned basic language. Now, we don't have to keep relearning it. We have got it with us. It's like a, it's like a resource that is there within us. But the jnana which we need to find our way through the world, it is not so much a set of data or information, it is more an attitude of looking at the world. So when we have this attitude of looking at the world, then what will happen is that we, whenever we face distractions or temptations, we will be able to say no to them. We will be able to focus on what is really important. So in this sense, Jnana is not a one-time thing, it's a process. So, therefore Krishna, when he talks about Jnana, he doesn't talk about the components. Okay, if you have this information, so if you understand the soul, if you understand there is a soul, if you understand that there are gunas, this, 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 then you will have knowledge. That could be one way of looking at it. But knowledge is something which we continuously need to keep acquiring. Okay. And for that purpose, we need a certain set of values. So now, there are virtues and there are values. The two words are somewhat similar, like we have in schools value education. So virtues, we don't somebody say virtue education, it's a value education. So what is the meaning of the word values? Values refer to the at one level they refer to what is valuable and then there is what is valuable and there is what feels valuable now the two may not be the same thing like say for example consider an alcoholic now maybe they have a job deadline and the job deadline is what is valuable. The job is what is valuable. But then, you consider alcoholic, the drink feels valuable. So the greater the, if we consider the alcoholic situation, that the greater the mismatch between what is valuable and what feels valuable, we say that the person has poor values. The person has not grown with good values. So, when we say value education, it is basically the education by which what is valuable and what feels valuable that becomes more and more aligned together. So, for example, sometimes we may speak rudely to someone. And then, if later on we find out that the person is very powerful, 
and that person complains about us or that person gets some gundas and tries to beat us up, then we may go and apologize. You know, there is some regret, but that regret is different from say, we speak something bad and then we feel, hey, I should not have got angry. But there is no external consequence over there. But still we feel bad. So that is because of the values of a person. I hope this difference is clear, what I am trying to say. That that means that if you do some, if there is some wrongdoing. Hmm, and that may be followed by regret. But the regret may be because of <coughs> external consequence. Or the regret may be because of internal conscience. Hmm. Now which indicates better values? Internal, internal conscience. conscience. Now, if somebody doesn't care for external consequences also, then we will say that person has pathetic values, isn't it? So, there is, so basically the idea is that in life, we will constantly be encountering situations. And when we are encountering situations, we need to know what to focus on. In one sense, what is knowledge? Knowledge from an operational perspective. Hmm? Knowledge is that which guides our vision. Guides our vision toward what matters. Say for example, hmm, if somebody has medical knowledge, somebody is a doctor, then when somebody comes to a doctor's clinic, it, oh, you could, we could look at that person's, the kind of clothes they are wearing, the kind of hairstyle they have, the kind of glasses they are wearing. But if the doctor sees, okay, the person's color is very pallid, maybe their eyes have become red, maybe their fingers have become discolored, the doctor will say, okay, this means this person is sick, maybe this is a disease. So in general, let's say if a car mechanic, they come to, uh, somebody comes with a car, and that person, uh, you could look at the model of the car, you could look at the car plate number, you could look at various things about the car. But then the car mechanic will say, okay, you know, this noise indicates that the carburetor is spoiled. So now, the other things that matter, but generally speaking, the Gita uses the word Jnana Chakshu. Jnana Chakshu or later on, Shastra Chakshu. Both of these are words. Chakshu is what? Eyes. So, what does this actually do? This is basically the Jnana guides our vision to see what really matters. And somebody who doesn't have that Jnana Chakshu, they may just get caught in incidental details. So, they need, we need, when we are studying, we need to focus when, when say if we are attending a class then we need to focus on the subject matter that is being spoken now of course naturally we will notice the teacher the teacher is giving the knowledge but somebody gets too caught in say how the teacher's expression is how the teacher's pronunciation is and some people may make fun of how the teacher pronounces some words or a part of behavior everybody has their behavioral idiosyncrasies now you can mock them you can fixate on them but then that, then we will not be learning much in this class. So in one sense, jnana is that which enables us to it guides our vision to focus on what really matters. So I'll put all what I'm saying together now. That when there is education. There is there are three levels you could say of education. In education, there is learning the subject. Hmm. Then there is learning how to learn. Hmm. Okay, so I learned this one subject and then I got a hang. Okay, you know, so where do we find the more important books? Where is this miscellaneous material which may or may not be We learn how to learn. And then, most important is we are learning the value of learning. 
or we can say getting a taste for learning. So if somebody gets this, then they can keep learning and growing. So now learning the subject, this is what is more or less information. Okay, I studied uh, engineering maths and I know the subject. But if somebody gets the attitude of learning, then that person can be eager to keep learning and growing in life. So when Krishna is using the word jnana, he is not using it in this sense of getting a information or subject. He is using this in terms of getting the attitude by which we can keep learning. And therefore, when he talks about learning, he focuses on values. So I'll just talk about two values which Krishna talks about, just to illustrate this point. So the first value that Krishna talks about is humility. Now, in fact, Krishna talks about totally 20 values. 20 values that comprise knowledge. So when he is saying comprise knowledge, that means these comprise the values that will help a person to keep acquiring knowledge. So now humility, the way Prabhupada defines it, one simple way to understand it is that there is what we know. Everyone knows some things in life. And there is what we don't know. So humility means to consider the possibility that what I don't know may be more important than what I know. So in this sense, humility is actually quite similar to curiosity. So, in terms of gaining knowledge, if a person thinks that I know everything, then they can't learn anything. See, a teacher may know the subject, but if a teacher hears the students, then what happens? The teacher can learn still more. Okay, okay, this part of the subject is easy to communicate. This part of the subject is a little more difficult to communicate. This part of the subject students get easy. This part, maybe we need to give some more examples. So you can always keep learning. Now the teacher knows the subject, but for a teacher to communicate effectively with the audience, you know, what the audience knows, <coughs> or where the audience is coming from, that may be more important. So humility means to be open to the possibility that what we, do, what we don't know may be more important than what we know. When Prabhupada went to America, initially he was staying in Butler, Pennsylvania. And he was staying at the house of one Gopal Agarwal and Sali Agarwal. They were Indians. Gopal was the, his father had sponsored Prabhupada's visit to India. His father got his son to sponsor the visit, a visit from India. And he, Gopal had married this American girl, Sally. And then they were, they had just done this as a favor to, to their father, father or father-in-law. And apparently they had written like the sponsorship letters for many people, but nobody had ever come. So they hadn't actually expected Swamiji also to come. So for them, when Swamiji came, it was a big shock. You know, so they housed when Prabhupada sized things up immediately. And after talking to Prabhupada, saw that they were not very interested. So then Prabhupada was not so much preaching to them because he saw they were not so interested. Then. This Sally Agarwal, her memories are, of Prabhupada are given in the Lamrud, and she says, Swamiji was eager to know everything about America. He says, how the vacuum cleaner works, how the washing machine works, how you punch the tickets to go in the local. Now, did Prabhupada go to America to learn how the vacuum cleaner works? <coughs> no. Prabhupada, through all this, wanted to understand how the American mind works, how American society functions. And then he could communicate more effectively to Americans. So, what we don't know may be more important than what we know. That is the key, key principle of humility. Say, if we have this, then we can always keep learning in life. So, 
this humility will ensure that a person will not fall into maya when somebody comes hey this particular temptation i'm not going to fall to that but maybe the temptation is coming in a more 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 forceful way than what i had thought maybe i need to know a little bit more about it so humility will protect us so so when krishna talks about these values what is he talking about the values that will help us to detect what really matters and what doesn't matter to detect what is the reality and what is the illusion that will take us away from reality so like that krishna talks about oh then he says amanitvam adamitvam ahimsa shanti rajyam like that he goes on on a full list and then he says that janma mrityu jara vyadi dukh doshan darshanam he says that see the dukh in the material world <coughs> now why is it important because if one doesn't see this and one doesn't adequately contemplate this then one may not feel the need for spiritual inquiry at all generally speaking philosophy it remember i gave a def- uh, when do people think about philosophy in misery in misery yes so and the biggest misery is death so often death is the greatest prompter for philosophical discussion so if somebody doesn't just think about that at all at all then they will have no reason to think about philosophy life is wonderful life will soon become wonderful so this contemplation janma mrityu jara vyadi dukha dosha anudarshanam systematically contemplate this regularly contemplate this with a unblinking eye with a with a clear eyed realism this is what will impel one to focus on spirituality so otherwise if i think oh it's like the future is extending eternally ahead for me nobody will say that i am never going to die but most people when they talk about death they think it's like it's something that is going to happen long long lay far far away after a long long time it's almost like they're talking about that is going to happen to someone else different from me <laughs> in fact there was a greek philosopher of course he was not a philosopher he was a philosopher <laughs> so he said i will never die how because as long as i am there death won't be there and death is there i won't be there <laughs> <laughs> so now we can do word jugglery <laughs> but uh, it is we who will have to experience the trauma the agony of death so to summarize this whole point that see why am i emphasizing so much on the gyan aspect here that when the gita talks about gyan it is not just some components of information that comprise gyan it is more a process that will help us keep acquiring gyan so gyana in this sense it is not static it is not static information i got it and that's over say for example it's like math tables we learned it in our childhood and it's over so that is not the gyana that is it is gyana is more of a dynamic perception that is as we face different situations in life how we are, are we able to perceive dynamic perception again of what really matters what is the important thing over here what is the reality it means krishna versus maya so that perception that is actually what is gyan and that's why it's more of a value system that helps us to have a particular way of perceiving the world that's the emphasis on gyan so here i have adopted a slightly different approach uh, rather than uh, putting the whole 13 chapter as a verse as i said the some of these chapters are very technical and putting them in verse is a bit difficult so i put some of the verses as prayers 
So let's look at that. Your teaching about learning is what we need to be learning. Education is meant to boost our virtues, not our earning. We are defined not by what we know, but by what we do with what we know. Virtues are the actual heart of knowledge. These are not learned merely by going to college. <laughs> there we may get information, but not realization, which comes only by humble service done with dedication. One of the things they talk about is Acharya Pas. You know, that is one of the components of knowledge Krishna Seva. Anything else is just noise pretending to be the words of the wise. <laughs> it is decorated ignorance that won't free me from the wise of wise. So wise is basically like a tight grip. So wise has a grip on us. Please, O oh Lord, let my knowledge not inflate my ego. Instead, let it show the way that towards you will go. So this is basically the idea of knowledge as a set of values that enables us to choose and keep moving towards Krishna. So now after this, Krishna will talk about, he has talked about Kshetra and Kshetra Gya. He has talked about Jnana. And then he will talk about Gnaya. Gnaya is the object of knowledge. Now how many of you have heard the word object? Oh, it is such a common word, you may object to the question itself. <laughs> okay. But let's see, when I use the word object of knowledge, what does it mean to you? Focus. Focus. So, it is the theme, the topic, the area, object of knowledge. What is it that we are trying to know? Now here, at one level, we can know we can inquire about anything and we humans, there is a, the Atma has the Chit facility. Chit means that we are conscious and because we are conscious, we are curious. But what we are curious of, that is determined by our attachments. Our consciousness is our capacity to know. Curiosity is our eagerness to know. Now what are we eager to know? So, conscious, because we are conscious, we have the capacity to know. But, say right now because we have the capacity to know, say if I say that, you know, okay, uh, I will teach all of you French. Say, French? I don't know, I have spend time to spend on that. If I say I will teach Sanskrit, okay, some of you may be interested. So, there is eagerness to know. So we can know about many things in the world. So when Krishna uses the word Gnaya, he is focusing on not just the object of knowledge, he is talking more about the worthy object of knowledge. And not just worthy, the most worthy object of knowledge. That means what is really worth knowing? There is knowledge, as I said, the it is what really matters. <coughs> You may have heard this, I often put in the difference between science and spirituality. Science is the study of matter. Spirituality is the study of what matters. What really matters? So spirituality is not just the study of spirit. Yes, when we analyze what matters, we will eventually understand that the spiritual matters more than the material. But spirituality generally, the study of what matters. So, when Krishna is talking about Gnaya, he is talking about what really matters in life. What is really important. And with that in mind, he focuses on two things. The Atma and the Paramatma. The soul and the super soul. And of course, their relationship. So he says, this is what really matters. And why is this the most worthy object of knowledge? Krishna says, 
गेयम यत्तत प्रवक्षामी यद्यात्वा अमृतमश्नुते इस इस बाय नोइंग दिस यू विल अटेन लिब्रेशन यू विल बिकम यू विल अटेन इटर्नल लाइफ नाउ कैन वी से दैट बाय लर्निंग अबाउट सॉफ्टवेयर कोडिंग विल अटेन इटर्नल लाइफ नाउ इट बे हैव सम ऑपरेशनल वैल्यू यू नॉट the fuller of eternity so that will give us so if he says yes gyatva amruta mashnuti amruta the what does the word amruta mean amruta has two meanings eternal and also means elixir or elixir is a very technical word nectar is a simple word is it amrut the devatas have the amrut so basically when krishna is yad gyatva amrutam ashnute so krishna the atma has three faculties sat chit ananda so krishna basically says we should use our chit our knowing faculty to know the things which will help us to realize the sat and to realize the ananda so which subject we can be curious about many things in life but what curiosity will help us to re realize our eternality what curiosity will help us to realize our joyfulness innate joyfulness that is the most <coughs> important curiosity <coughs> so once when sri prabhupada was going on a morning walk in a in north america one pro professor was the company him and they were walking along and prabhupada says so what is the current scientific knowledge about the soul and he said currently there is no scientific knowledge about the soul and prabhupada said then their knowledge is useless <laughs> so he said no 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 swami ji he said science is a different kind of knowledge they were walking through a park and he says swami ji for now for example now we have two large volumes of books explaining how this grass grows <laughs> Prabhupada replied, "That grass will grow without your two books." <laughs> that this this professor was also intelligent. He said that, "But Swami Ji, if God didn't want us to study the grass, why did He put the grass there?" Prabhupada said, "My point is that you study the grass and forget the God who put it there." <laughs> so it is not that you don't study the grass; that can be studied. but if we study only that and forget god so spirituality is the study of what matters so okay studying grass it matters to some extent but as compared to what really matters that is not all that important so the study of what matters so this is where we are talking about this 13th verse now geyam yattat pravakshami pravakshami means i will speak to you i will speak to you about that object of knowledge yat gyatva by knowing this what will happen amrutam shnute you will attain eternal happiness geyam yat tat pravakshami geyam yat tat pravakshami yat gyatva amrutam shnute yat gyatva amrutam shnute so i'll focus on this phrase only let's recite it once more together geyam yattat pravakshami yajyatva amritam ashnute so now krishna will the next section of the gita is this from verse 13 onwards 13 second half till the verse 18 or 19 mad bhakta etad vigyaya mad bhava yopapadyate mad bhakta etad vigyaya it says all this can be understood by those who have devotion to me and then they will attain my nature now this can be quite confusing and complex because broadly there are two schools of thought that now there is the atma and there is the paramatma there is the soul and there is the super soul so the two schools of thought are that the soul enters into the super soul 
and there is merges is merge and the other is this is this is the impersonal idea now the other is that the soul doesn't merge but link there's a link with love there's a bond of love this is the bhakti world view there are two different world views about the relationship between the soul and the super soul now <clears throat> krishna in this section sometimes speaks verses that can seem to support both world views but if we look at it as krishna moves forward in this chapter and in this section of the gita it's very clear krishna is talking about how he he is talking about a bond of love that's why he says mad bhakta etad vikya ya so the nature of language is sometimes words can be misinterpreted and uh, misinterpreted sometimes uh, so there are two things when, with respect to words there can be miss to miss one is misinterpretation and the other is misunderstand in both cases there is a miss is <laughs> it we miss something we, so what is the difference between misunderstand and misinterpret is the difficult difficult to understand is the difference <laughs> is the difference difficult to understand misunderstand and misinterpret yes Okay, that would be misapply, isn't it? <laughs> There is another miss over there. <laughs> okay, the first part is correct. We don't get misinterpret. Get in the wrong way. Well, yeah, it's get in the wrong way. That is true, but it is a little more than that. <laughs> yes, it is. more like give in a wrong way <laughs> now that means misinterpret means that some there are two possibilities see i may misunderstand and therefore i may miscommunicate i got wrong information or i understood the information wrong i told that to you. but generally misunderstand it is more unintentional misinterpret is often intentional the language is not fixed sometimes this interpret can also be unintentional but generally interpretation is an act of that involves conscious analysis conscious intention conscious intelligence so there is much in the gita in general any philosophical work which is complex it is possible to misunderstand but then if somebody doesn't seek the right understanding instead they take their own world view and impose it then they are and then they share that then what happens then they are misinterpreting so <clears throat> which among the two is worse misinterpreting yes misinterpreting is worse it's like say suppose suppose uh, So there's a speaker over here who doesn't say who doesn't speak Hindi, and say the entire audience is Hindi. So I am translating for that speaker. But then the speaker says something, and I speak something else differently in entirely in Hindi. Now, now the speaker is speaking English. The speaker doesn't understand Hindi, and the audience doesn't understand English. <laughs> so what happens then? So it's like there is a speaker, there is the audience, and in one sense, the translator <coughs> is the bridge, isn't it, between the audience and the speaker. So now the speaker is understanding only English, the audience understands only Hindi, and now. the speaker is giving a speech and the translator is giving another speech <laughs> and suppose one audience comes over there and they understand english 
<laughs> and then that person says, hey, you are not translating right. He says, hey, you know, a nice class is going on. Why are you disturbing? Be peaceful. Well, no. It is not a matter of being peaceful. It's a matter of being purposeful. See, if the translator wants to give a speech, fine. You know, get your own audience and give a speech. But if you are translating, you are saying that you are translating someone else's speech and then you are giving a separate speech. That is not healthy. That is not deceptive actually. So that's why Prabhupada would say that when people give their own opinions based on the Bhagavad Gita, that is not Bhagavad Gita as it is. That is Bhagavad Gita as you are. It is as you are. So, okay, you write your own book. You want your own philosophy? Perfectly fine. You can give your own philosophy. But that is the challenge. So, the point which the Gita is the relationship between the soul and super soul is the relationship of love. And Mad Bhakta Vidyaya. When we understand this, then we can become liberated. Now, after this, the Krishna will talk about Purusha and Prakriti, which is the last two parts of the Gita. Now, in Purusha and Prakriti, let's look at Krishna talks about let's look at two examples. See, one of the relationship between Purusha and Prakriti. This is a little technical concept, but I think it may interest you. In fact, this is, is a concept which uh, which led to the idea of the soul being rejected in mainstream philosophy in the West. So there is one famous philosopher, he said, in the history of philosophy, there is no idea as dead as the idea of the soul. Now, <laughs> that the soul can never die, but his thought is this, the soul is, as the idea, it's completely dead. You now, Frederick Nietzsche said, God is dead. This person says, soul is dead. So now, why do they say this? Uh, but let's try to understand this. See, let's look at these two metaphors. Or let's look at one of those metaphors of how the soul functions in the world. The 33 is one metaphor, 34th is another metaphor. So, yatha prakashayatya eka. Prakasha means light. To give illuminate. Eka is one. Kutsnam lokam, in Kutsna means everything. See, Krishna and Kutsna is different. Kutsna is everything. Kutsnam lokam, this entire world. Ekam ravi, imam ravi, sorry. This, this, the sun illuminates the entire known world for us. So, yatha prakasha yatyeka, yatha prakasha yatyeka, Kutsnam lokam imam ravi, Kutsnam lokam imam ravi. Similarly, Kshetram, Kshetra is the body. Kshetri, Kshetri is the soul. The Kshetri is the Kshetragya. Tatha Kutsnam. Similarly, the entire Kshetra, the entire body is illuminated by the Kshetra. Prakash, Prakashyati is illuminated, is activated, is energized. Bharata. So, Kshetram Kshetri Tatha Kritsnam Kshetram Kshetri Tatha Kritsnam Prakashayati Bharata Prakashayati Bharata Together Yatha Prakashayati Eka Kritsnam Lokam Imam Ravi Kshetram Kshetri Tatha Kritsnam Prakashayati Bharata So, here the example that Krishna is giving is just as the sun illuminates the universe. Similarly, the soul illuminates the body. Sun and universe. Soul and body. Now, what is the significance of this example? See, the sun, say, causes photosynthesis on the earth. The sun causes the plants to grow. When the sun rises, then the birds wake up, all of nature starts becoming active, most of nature. There is some nocturnal nature also. But uh, most of nature becomes active when the sun rises. So the point is that the sun is far away, but the sun radiates its influence. 
So similarly, what Krishna is saying, the soul, in a, soul is separate from the body, but the soul radiates its influence to the body. So this metaphor conveys something important about the relationship between the soul and the body. So now in the Western, in Western philosophy, what happened as science started advancing? Science has this, one of the principles is what they call as causal completeness. Causal completeness means that any effect can be, its cause can be completely explained in material terms. So any effect that is there, so for example, if I drop this phone, oh, what will happen? You say, have you dropped your intelligence? Why are you dropping the phone? <laughs> but if I drop the phone, the phone will fall. Now, if I fling the phone down, it will fall faster. So now, why did the phone fall faster? Or if, if say in the first case, the phone just cracks a little bit. In the second case, it cracks much more. Now, why in the second case, it, second case it cracked more? Because it struck with, it's along with greater force. So, in one sense, the effect of the phone getting cracked can be explained in terms of a material cause. So, and the if we understand the cause more clearly, then we'll understand the effect also more clearly. So, what what the philosophers, especially philosophers, influenced by science they started arguing is that the way things happen in the body the way things happen in the physical physiological anatomical working of the body there is no room for the soul what they mean is that the body acts because we eat food so the material source of energy food is what is giving energy to the body and every action see, if I lift my hand up you know, how fast I can lift my hand up how much weight I can lift up my hand up, that can be explained in terms of how much muscles I have in my hand uh, how much well how much skilled I am in say movement of my body uh, so how much habitual I am to weightlifting. So every event, every action done with the body can be explained in terms of the material components of the body. So therefore, there is no room for the soul in this. And you could say, we could start the causal chain. Say, if I see a snake, and the information goes in and then in my brain hey this is a snake I don't protect myself, I have to run and then the signal comes through my brain and then I start running away so the all the behavior of the body functionally can be explained in terms of material cause and effect and therefore they say there is no room for the soul to act now, is the is this argument a sound argument? What do you think? Okay, first of all, is the argument understandable at all? Yes. What they're saying? Yes. Hmm? Yes. But now we say this was actually considered to be a fatal argument. For that, René Descartes was a philosopher who prominently proposed the idea of the soul. And he proposed, I mean many people, but in modern history, he was one of the prominent proponents of the soul, Cogito Argo Sam, he said, that I think, therefore I am. So he proposed the idea of the soul, and he had the idea that the soul is situated somewhere in the pituitary gland. Because at that time, the idea was, the pituitary gland is connected with the entire brain, and therefore, it can control the entire brain, and it can control the entire body. Thereafter. So now, the idea of material causal completeness mm -hmm. that is something which science focuses on and there is 
in one sense, there is truth to it. And even the Shastras accept it. Krishna says, Om Purnam, not Krishna, Vishwamishad says, Om Purnam, Adaha Purnam Idam. Adaha Purnam Idam means that this world's functioning can be explained in material terms. When Newton saw the fruit falling, the apple falling, Newton believed in God. But he wanted to know what made the fruit fall. That time he was not looking for God made the fruit fall. Isn't it? He was looking for a material mechanism. And that's perfectly fine. So, now there is, there is a fundamental mistake. When science says that there is causal completeness, therefore there is no need for the soul. There is no role for the soul. But the point is, when you say no role for the soul, that is based on, we say, we say no material force or influence of the soul. No material force or influence in bodily functioning. That is the basis for saying that. But that has the fundamental assumption that actually the soul should have a material influence. But the soul is spiritual, isn't it? Because the soul is spiritual, the soul doesn't have material influence. The soul doesn't need to have a material influence. Say for example, if somebody is driving a car. Now we have the car, uh, the standard example. I'll take three examples with increasing sophistication to illustrate this point. And then we'll conclude this chapter, this discussion. Say if you consider the car and body metal. Now, when the car moves, does it move because the driver wants to go somewhere or does it move because its engine is activated by the fuel in it? Sorry? Both are correct. See, the point is, that if we look at the material mechanism, mm -hmm. the fuel is the cause of the car's motion. Isn't it? If there is no fuel, the car will not move. That's perfectly true. But there is also a personal intention. There's a person who has the intention of going there. Now that person may just come and touch a button. See, traditionally cars have keys, you put in the key and then move it. Some of the more modern cars, you don't have to uh, put a key. You just touch a button, it starts moving. So now, how fast the car moves? Is that proportional to how much force is put on the button? No, that touch of the button is a very minor thing. But that is enough for the mechanism to get active. So we could say, why is the car moving so fast? You know, because, uh, because the accelerator has been pressed. But the accelerator, accelerator being pressed is not the source of the power of the car, isn't it? The accelerator, it is pressed, it activates the mechanism by which the car is moving. So, so you are getting this difference that if somebody wants to run fast, then they have to ex execute, exercise the physical energy to run fast. Somebody wants the car to move fast, it's not like they have to exercise their energy to press the accelerator very hard. So, the more sophisticated the mechanism, what happens is, the energy required from the conscious person can become lesser and lesser. If you want to have a horse, and you want the horse to go fast, then you may have to pull the bridle of the horse, you may have to whip the horse. You have to use your legs to, maybe you have goals to pinch the horse in the neck. So, there the horse rider also has to exercise force. But, so the more sophisticated the mechanism, less visible is the role activating the mechanism. You 
you could say not even the role, let us put it, the agent, whatever the agent is. There is the agent activating the mechanism. Nowadays, I was in America and person said, one person came to me and said, oh, is this uh, Prabhupada gives a soul and car example, he says now Google has auto driving cars. So, even Tesla has made auto driving car. So, as an example become invalid. He said, Prabhupada says the soul is like the driver of the car. The point is not that the soul is like physically driving the car. We may say the car is driving automatically, but it is driving because of the intention of the driver. See it? Sorry? Desire. 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 Intention, desire, whatever word you want to use. The agency is coming from the driver. Now, as the sophisticated, as the car becomes more sophisticated, you don't need the, to be consciously exerting force to operate. But still the operation happens. So basically, when an event happens, there is a material mechanism to explain it. And then there is a non-material non-material motivation to explain it and these two are not contradictory they are complementary they are complementary so say so there is a there is a world cup final match now the world t20 world cup final is coming up so say in the last ball we need to hit a we need six runs to win and maybe the Indian captain is batting and the ball comes as a bouncer and the bat hooks the ball and goes over the boundary and everybody is delirious with joy and then after in the post-match interview they ask the captain okay you know, how did you hit the sixer and he says by Newton's laws of motion <laughs> <laughs> And now, is that a valid explanation? <laughs> yeah, it's a valid explanation, but it's not the relevant explanation. <laughs> valid means you can say, okay, the ball came at this pace, the bat was swung with this much force, and the ball and bat had contact at this angle. If it had caught at the top edge, then the ball would have ballooned up, and instead of going over the boundary, it would have gone into the hands of the fielder over there. So all that, the Newton's laws of motion are a valid explanation. But when the commentator is asked, when the interviewer is asking, that's not the relevant question. They say, okay, did you anticipate that it's going to be a bouncer? Had you practiced a hook shot? How do you decide in which area to hit? So those are the questions that they want to know. So these two are parallel explanations. So when we talk about spirituality and the soul being the source of consciousness, we are not saying that the soul uh, the soul falsifies or rejects the material mechanisms by which the uh, by which the thing works it is that there is a now consider for example a video game this is the last example i said i took an example of a sophisticated car then i took the example of a cricket match Cricket match will focus on two levels of explanation can be complementary. But the last is, suppose there is a very sophisticated video game. Mm -hmm. Now, in some video games, you know, people, maybe they are playing Grand Auto Theft or whatever. So then, you move your hand in this way, the car moves this way, and then you press this and the car moves this way, and the car moves fast, the car moves slow, all these things are there. So now, sometimes, when people play that, then they may have levers that they pull. All that they just have just a mouse uh, which they move on a screen. So now, in one sense, if you look at how fast the car is moving, and what they are doing, they are just moving their hand or a little bit of finger or one finger. In one sense, they are doing practically nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you consider a little more sophisticated thing, there was uh, Stephen Hawking. You know, he had severe inabilities. So, we can appreciate his willpower, but at the same time, there is a very sophisticated mechanism by which his intention 
you know, whatever little he was able to do, whatever little he was able to, whatever little control he had, that was translated into words, that was translated into action. That's why his voice was so metallic. So it is the machine producing the voice. So what is happening over here is, now in this case, one of my friends works in uh, neuro, not neuroscience, it's like neural engineering. So they said that even if your body is completely paralyzed, you can try to read the brain signals and that translate that into motor motion. So that you can uh, do uh, some function. So the point is that the more sophisticated the mechanism, the more there can be a link which does not involve material force, but there's a link. So now where does this link come from? Say in the video game, the key link between the person playing the video game and what is happening in the video game. That link is established by the maker of the video game. Okay? So similarly, the link between the soul and the body, that is established through the super soul. So, the soul does not act as a material factor within the functioning of the body. But the soul's intention, the soul's desire that is transmitted to the body through the whole system that is created by the super soul. So now the, now when we, if you are playing a video game, now we may not even know exactly. Hey, when I press this, just like this press this and the car starts moving so fast. How does it happen? We don't know that. But the video game maker knows it. The video game, uh, uh, somebody that wants to make a good video game, what they need is, they need to know how things will move inside the video game. They will also need to know what kind of moves the video game, video gamer wants to make. And when they know both of these, then they can make a good game. So, if you consider these three examples, car, a cricket shot, and a video game. So, video game needs to know moves in the game, or rather moves or movement in the game, how the things move in the game, and moves of the gamer. Moves means what kind of moves they want to know. When they need both, they act as the link. So basically what happens is, there is matter, there is spirit, and there is the controller. So Krishna or the super, super soul, you know, obviously this is the, you get an MSc degree, matter, spirit and controller. You understand all these three things. So God is the link between the soul and the body. Now when René Descartes had the idea that there is the soul, in the Christian tradition, the idea that God personally is present in everyone's heart, that is not so prominent. They have the idea of the Holy Spirit. Now what it is, it is, it is, it is a bit mystical. It seems to be like an energy or whatever it is. They have different ideas. Sometimes they use the word Holy Ghost. And Prabhupada is asked, what do you think about the Holy Ghost? Prabhupada said, all ghosts are unholy. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but, you know, uh, Christians may have their own theological explanation of what the Holy Ghost is. They use the word ghost more for something subtle, something not gro grossly material. But whatever it is. But the idea is that the super soul as the personal presence of the divine in every heart, that idea is not there in the Christian tradition. And that is why for them to explain how the soul interfaces with the body is very difficult. And in the Buddhist tradition also, the idea of the soul is there. But again, they don't have the idea of the Paramatma. Their idea of soul is also quite peculiar. See, it's like, uh, their idea of soul is just like a set of samskaras which will disappear. Eventually when you become getting nirvana. So they don't they, they, they have what they call as anattavad. Anattavad means that we don't accept the Atma. 
there is something which is a source of consciousness, but eventually that something, it doesn't have to be liberated, it has to be extinguished. And then you will be free from suffering. So it's like there is soul and reincarnation. So what happens is, the soul without reincarnation, that is Christianity. They accept soul, but they don't accept reincarnation. And reincarnation without soul. <laughs> that is Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hmm. Next bodies will come. Yes, exactly. Comes yeah, but then the sanskaras have to have some place where they are at. <laughs> so it's a little complicated. They say that, uh, anyway, they have their own metaphors. But, uh, who will get liberated? Hmm? Who will get liberated? No, they say that you have to. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get liberated from everything, even the idea of getting liberated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Buddhists among all philosophers, Buddhists are the most brilliant at world journey. They say the Shunya is, is proper translated as the voidism. Voidism is like non-existence. But they say that's not true. Voidism or Shunya is the existence beyond existence and non-existence. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, um, you know, generally speaking, the the more see the human intelligence is such that it will always want to defend whatever it believes. So, the more difficult a philosophy is to explain. The more difficult is the word jugglery used to hide that it can't be explained. <laughs> so that's what happens. But anyway, this idea that the Vedic tradition, that how exactly the soul and the body interface, now this is a unique insight that the Vedic tradition can offer. That now, now how exactly all this will be phrased in scientific terms? This is a distinct challenge. But consciousness is a hugely emerging field and uh, even I mean, there are many devotees who are interested in science, they are going in this field now. We have, we have created a whole forum of devotee scientists who are specifically focusing on consciousness. And now in today's world what has happened is the existence of God because it's become a way too polarizing. God has become a much more of a religious, God is seen much more of a religious idea. And nobody in the mainstream universities wants to fund research into the existence of God. But research into the existence of consciousness or want to say the source of consciousness, that is very much a new thing. And that there's a lot of potential for the soul. So the idea that this, the soul acts and influences the body through the intermediate arrangement of the super soul. And that is, I have explained in very simple terms, but Sadaput Prabhu was one of the most prominent scientists in our movement, Dr. Richard Thompson. He wrote a book called Mechanistic and Non-Mechanistic Science. So mechanistic science is where we look at mechanisms, but non-mechanistic science is where we look for something beyond the mechanisms. And this particular section of the Gita with all its metaphors is, is very rich with potential for both philosophical investigation and scientific exploration. And, but as I said, the Gita's purpose in analyzing Kshetra and Kshetra Gya is primarily to enable us to attain liberation. So Krishna has concluded this whole chapter by saying that Kshetra Kshetra Gyanyor Evam that these two, these two which we discuss, Antaram Jnana Chakshusha. Understand they are different. How do you understand that? Jnana Chakshusha. With that, Kshetra Kshetra Gyanyo Revam Kshetra Kshetra Gyanyo Revam Antaram Jnana Chakshusha Antaram Jnana Chakshusha So if you understand this, what will happen? Bhuta Prakriti Moksham Cha. That Prakriti, 
in the material nature which we are caught moksha we will attain liberation and then not only that ye vidur yanti te para man who knows this will attain the supreme destination go to the supreme destination bhuta prakriti moksham cha bhuta prakriti moksham cha ye vidur yanti te param ye vidur yanti te param so krishna is saying that this is this knowledge if you understand then we can truly understand that the difference between the matter and spirit between body and soul and the soul can become liberated so the sun example what it conveys is that the sun doesn't have to be physically present and physically acting for things to act in the soul now of course we can say the sun is giving material energy the solar energy is coming that is true but solar energy it's not a gross physical thing so just like there are subtle subtle ways in which an influence can happen without necessarily a physical force being exerted similarly the soul can influence the body without it need without it needing to be a, a source of material force the source the soul is a non material cause in the functioning of the body so i'll summarize what we discussed today broadly in this chapter 13 we talked about arjuna's questions the purpose of the question is basically to bring a link between his previous knowledge and his current knowledge the gita's knowledge with arjuna's previous knowledge now we could say that this link can happen in many different ways it can happen that our present knowledge builds on the previous knowledge our present knowledge cancels a part of partially previous knowledge it it intermingles in different ways so generally knowledge doesn't grow in vacuum and so when he is asking about terms he is not looking for a dictionary meaning he is looking at the world view underlying those terms and then we discussed the meaning of kshetra and kshetra ke briefly but a major part of the class was focused on the concept of gyana so gyana is not information it is uh, it is more like the values that guide vision or that guide information seeking you can say how we look at the world so that we can constantly be focusing on what matters because in the vedic tradition the purpose of gyana to put it this way that in sankhya in and broadly in the vedic tradition versus in science in sankhya the purpose was liberation detachment in science it is more of control power so there is a very different purpose of what we are trying to know so when the purpose is to become liberated then we constantly need to keep seeing what really matters in the situation so we could say education it can be at different levels we learn subject we learn how to learn and we learn the value or taste of learning so when krishna is talking about gyana gyana is referring to this level not this level so so we discussed two two values for example humility humility what does it mean it is like curiosity it is what i know it may not be as important as what i don't know so with this what happens is our ego won't trap us in illusion if temptation comes in some new way we will be able to see it and similarly we discussed another point was that <coughs> perceiving distress that why do we need to perceive the distresses of the world because then they will make us look beyond they will make us seek beyond so that 
uh, focus on death is helpful. So then we discussed about Gnaya. Gnaya is the object of knowledge. So when Krishna is talking about the object of knowledge, he is focusing on the most worthy object of knowledge. And what is the most worthy aspect? So in one sense, that which enables us, we use our chit. Chit is chit is the feature of the soul, that is we are conscious. And from conscious what happens? We become curious. But ideally is that we can use our curiosity to realize how we are eternal and how we are joyful. So this is Gyatva Amrita Mashrute. And this Gnaya is actually the knowledge of Atma, knowledge of Paramatma and the knowledge of the relationship between the two. And then we discuss here about uh, the difference between misunderstand versus misinterpret. So the Gita talks about his relationship in bhakti term, mad bhakta etad vikyaya, we discussed in 1380. And the last part we discussed was about the soul body relationship, the kshetra kshetri. So this was based on 1334, the second last verse, where Krishna says that the sun illuminates the sun and activates the universe, including the earth. So like that. So the soul is non-material and it is not a material factor in the body. So science, whether it is neuroscience or physiology or anatomy, it studies the material factors. So, can the body's functioning be explained in material terms? Yes, it can. Just as the car's functioning can be explained in mechanical terms. But is that the only explanation? No. There can be a mechanical explanation and there can be a non-mechanical explanation. So body, when it functions, there can be a mechanical explanation. That means, Some uh, say how particular bodily organs function. My hand moves, I can explain in terms of the signals coming from the brain, the information that has gone into the eyes. But that is not all that is going on. That is definitely going on. But something more is going on. And that connection, we discussed three examples. One is of a car, uh, maybe a, an auto driving car. Then we discussed the example of a cricket sixer, cricket shot, and then of a video game. So the more sophisticated the mechanism, the less visible or less tangible will be the role of the non-material agent. But still it is there. So the link between the soul and the body is established by the arrangement of the super soul. Just as the link between the video game player and the video game is established by the arrangement of the of the of the many maker of the game so krishna says once you understand this you get jnana chakshu and what will happen and so knowledge is that which guides our vision by that we will gain liberation and that is the ultimate purpose of life thank you very much hare krishna so are there any questions or comments Yes, please. Okay. Hey, Krishna Guruji. Like, uh, you said that the uh, material world is meant to look us beyond it. Uh, but uh, what we see in general, most of the people are like, uh, when they come to our Dukha, Janva, Chujaragaji, they become more like, uh, close their eyes towards the, when we don't want to die, why don't we enjoy the things like, more? Yes, that is true. That's why, it depends on the level of the people that what we emphasize death this is an event now in the next chapter we'll be discussing about the three modes which are the three modes sattva rajas and tamas so now depending on the consciousness of the person level of consciousness if the event of death is pursued by somebody in sattva then there will be 
philosophical contemplation. Okay, what is really important in life? Is there something beyond death? But if somebody is in rajas, then all that will happen is feverish indulgence. I say, let's enjoy more. The same fact, oh, youth is temporary. Don't get carried away in enjoyment. Youth is temporary. Enjoy before it goes away. That's it. The same fact, opposite perception. Because what has happened is, Rajoguna, this world is valued much more. So enjoy right now. So now that's why when we speak, what we speak is important. This is Prabhupada was so expert. Prabhupada didn't focus so much on death. You're all going to die there, which I Most of the audience was Rajasik. They wanted enjoyment. Prabhupada's focus was, since enjoyment is so trivial, it is too chum. There is so much more enjoyment available for you. Why don't you seek that? So Prabhupada was speaking in terms that people could understand. So we also have to focus in that way. Speaking too much about death, that is not good. Now, if somebody is in tamas and they hear about death, then they can just have panic. They can have what is called paranoia. <coughs> paranoia is basically the person feels constantly persecuted. Somebody is out, oh, there's danger here, somebody is out to get me. So, in general, you have to be very careful that we present spirituality in a way that attracts people. So, to some extent, when somebody has come to at least Sattva Guna, or at least some time of their life people are in Sattva Guna, <coughs> then that is the time when contemplation and death is happening. <coughs> if somebody is already having a lot of fear and insecurity, I was in Perth and my Mataji came to meet me and she said that, uh, she said, you know, I used to hear Bhavita classes regularly, but my therapist has told me that hearing Bhavita classes is psychologically damaging for you. Stop here. So I said, what happened? Why did he say that? He says she grew up in a very insecure family at home. You know, a lot of terrible things happened to her in her childhood. So she had a lot of fear complex. And slowly she grew out of it and she's chanting Hare Krishna help me. But then one day I attended a class and that whole class was about death can come at any time. And within that class, I mean, the speaker showed four or five different videos of people dying. Somebody is just going to a shopping mall to shop and suddenly they get a heart attack. Somebody is watching a sports match and they get a heart attack. So there's a batsman who was batting and while the ball was coming to him, he got a heart attack and he died. <laughs> so, so now what happened was, he said, after I saw that, that just triggered my past fear so much that I just couldn't function at all. So that's when I had to, I had stopped seeing a therapist, but I had to start seeing the therapist. So then I told her it's not that the Bhagavad Gita is psychologically damaging. It is that each of us, we may be psychologically damaged in particular ways. And certain kinds of presentations or certain themes of the Gita can trigger us. So we need to be careful about how we present. And you need, as I told you, you need to be careful about what kind of classes you use. And Bhagavad Gita wisdom will help you. But if particular emphasis on particular points is, is triggering to you, you can avoid it. So, yes. Death is favorable, thinking of death is favorable, but it requires a certain level of something consciousness. Okay? It depends, you know, is, is, is talking that you are going to die the only thing that you talk about? No, there are so many other things to talk about, isn't it? If you talk about how much in our device goes, how much you say you are going to die, therefore chant Hare Krishna. That's not the emphasis. There are so many aspects of philosophy to talk about. That's only one aspect. And in general, in today's world, fear driven outreach doesn't work. You are going to die, therefore chant Hare Krishna. You know, if you don't chant Hare Krishna, you won't go to hell. First of all, that's not philosophically true. But if you preach like that, you don't chant Hare Krishna, you won't go to hell, they say you go to hell right now. <laughs> I don't care for you. <laughs> Yes, please. Uh, Prabhu, the nature of soul is Satchidanand, 
and it is already having the anand like uh, whatever it needs so why and how is it having desires like desire is something that arises from my mind now. so does the soul desire mm. See, when the soul is conscious, the soul also has desires. But presently, many of our desires may be coming from our mind. When you are conscious, naturally you will have desire. Like I said, what I may desire, that may depend on my attachment. The pure soul will have the desire to love and serve Krishna. Or to hear more about Krishna, come in the presence of Krishna. That is the natural desire of the soul, the healthy desire of the soul. But, say from the soul, if you consider this to be the mind, you can say the mind is a subtle body, body. body. From the soul, the consciousness comes. Now, depending on the kind of conditioning that is there, the consciousness, the desires get colored in that particular. Mm -hmm. So, the pure consciousness is conditioned by the impressions in the mind. And accordingly, the desires are determined. So the more we change the impressions in our mind by by repeated practice of bhakti, by creating new impressions, then the soul's desires will become more and more naturally healthy. So the present desires, uh, what they are? They are desires of soul or the mind? See, that is quite difficult to determine. We could say most of the time the desires are of the mind. But rather than when you talk about desires, say rather than focusing on the source, we can focus on the destination. Because that is more easily perceived. Say for example, if somebody likes Kirtans. Now, are they liking Kirtans because uh, because their soul is attracted to Krishna? Or is it because their mind is attracted to music? And this is just one form of music for them. Maybe, maybe it doesn't matter. Isn't it? At, at this stage, the fact that they are attracted to Kirtan, that is good. And that through that, gradually the soul will become awakened, the spiritual desires will become activated. So, we can focus more on where our desires are taking us rather than where the desires are coming from. Is it clear the difference? That inside what pops up, it doesn't come to the convenient table. I have come from the mind. I have come from the soul. Isn't it? The desires just pop up. What we can do is, if, if our intelligence is alert enough, then we can evaluate. Do I want to act according to this desire, according to this desire or do I not want to act according? And that will be determined based on uh, uh, what, what do we determine based on? So that we can determine based on considering where following this desire will take me. So if the desire is coming from the mind also, see Krishna doesn't say you have to reject the mind to come to me. You don't have to kill the mind. It's just you have to make your mind a friend. So the healthy desire that are coming, the, so the, it is not that all the desires coming from the mind have to be unhealthy. Some of the desires coming from the mind can also be healthy. If we use those desires, then we, they can take us towards Krishna. Uh, so, Prabhu, like uh, soul is projecting something or just by the interaction, mind is getting some desires? Okay. I am not getting the desire to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> no. Say, if I consider my phone. Now, on my phone, some notification may pop up. Now when the notification pops up, that is coming by its own mechanism. There are settings and other things. But when that notification pops up, it's up to me. Whether I want to click the notification, tick or cross, whether I want to see it or not see it. So you could say the notifications are coming by the phone's mechanism. But that does not mean that I have no agency. In one sense, you could say that it is I only have made the settings by which the notification is coming. And now I have to make the decision whether the notification is something which I want to notice or not. So like that, the phone is like the mind. And I am the soul. 
So in the mind, various things will pop up. And what pops up in the mind is based on the impression, the samskaras in the mind. So basically you could say the phone's settings, they are like the mind's samskaras. So now it is for just as we choose, similarly the soul can choose. Now it is also possible that I can change some settings and then particular kind of modification will come more. So when Krishna says these two things, Abhyasa and Vairagya, these are two ways to manage the mind. So Abhyasa and Vairagya. Now what in terms of this metaphor you can say is Abhyasa is, it's create new impressions change the settings. So most of you, I think I give this example many times, I, this bollywood.com, you know this example? Yeah, so if our phone has got, a, if you have visited bollywood.com many times, and after now you come to the old Bhagavad so you want to visit bhagavad.com, but you type B, what will happen is, Bhagavad will not come, Bollywood will come. So what do you have to do, if you want to visit bhagavad.com, what do you have to do? You have to do abhyas, that is visit bhagavad.com again and again. And then, um, Vairagya means even if Bollywood.com comes as autocomplete, don't go there. So it is like um, reject or neglect the propositions from old impressions. So in this way, we can change what how the mind functions. That's why Krishna says the mind is a present, may presently be our enemy, but we want to make it our friend. So, do we that mm, okay. I think your intelligence is making things too complex right now. <laughs> so, basically, the soul works in the material world, and the soul needs tools for working in the material world. Say, so right now, I am speaking. So is it the soul speaking or the mouth speaking? <laughs> what do you think? It is the soul speaking through the mouth. Isn't it? So when the soul makes a decision, the soul makes a decision through the intelligence. But you know the more components you get into the model, the more complex it will become. So that's why generally when I talk, I don't get into the whole ego, intelligence and mind. Just soul and mind, two things. And that's what Krishna, that is the approach Krishna takes in 6.5 and 6. Krishna says elevate yourself with your mind, don't degrade yourself with the mind. Krishna doesn't say elevate yourself using your intelligence and then the mind, something like that. that there's a, there's a, there's a, this is a model and you can con consider different components of the model at different times. So it is true, when the intelligence is strong, the intelligence can evaluate. When the intelligence is weak, the intelligence will just capitulate, just listen to the mind. That is true. But ultimately it is the soul using the intelligence. It is not the intelligence making the decision. If the intelligence is strong, it is not the intelligence that overpowers the mind. It is the soul who uses the intelligence to overpower the mind. So, it's like say, if I am a person and I have say two bodyguards and there is some danger. Now one bodyguard may say, let's go in that direction, that's safe. Other bodyguard may say, let's go there, that's safe. Now, Whichever the two bodyguards may say do this, it's different things. It is I who have to decide, and then the bodyguard will act, isn't it? So basically, you could say that the person is like the soul over here, and ultimately the intelligence and the mind are both like bodyguards, or you could say more they are soul guards. So the mind is also meant for our functioning. And we don't pursue things only with reason. We pursue things also with emotion. And emotions are an important part of being human and ultimately of being spiritual. So the mind is a tool for perceiving emotions. Oh, when a mother sees her newborn baby, 
So, how does the mother see the baby? She sees that primarily with emotion. Isn't it? There's a comedian who said, what is a baby? He says, a baby is a bundle, loud noise comes from one side and nasty smells come from the other side. <laughs> <laughs> now, there is a truth to that, but that is, that is completely rational, totally unemotional. <laughs> Isn't it? So our emotions are also required for perceiving. So the mind is not entirely bad. The mind can be bad. But so both of them are tools. Ultimately, the soul using both the tools. Okay. Thank you. And we will have a few questions and we'll stop here yeah, too. Like Roger mentioned about Shetra and Shetragya. So Shetragya knows about Shetra means soul. Soul knows the body. So like in what way soul knows the body and like knows the means basically like the video gamer knows the video game. They know how to play the video game. But we don't know in, from a biological perspective there is much that is involuntary in the body. We don't know for example, I don't know how I breathe, how I digest food. But I know that when I put food in the body I get energy. So the video gamer doesn't know everything about the video game but the video gamer knows enough to be able to function to get the video game to function the way it wants. So it's similarly. So we know enough so that we can get it to function according to our desires. And how much it can function according to our desires, that depends on our past karma, how that much control we'll have. Okay. Maybe one or two questions for a moment later. Yeah. Well, Really just like intelligence and mind are the bodyguard of soul and soul use, uses for his work. So why the bad, bad thoughts and other things comes in the mind? Because so our desire is only to love the Krishna and serve the Krishna. Yeah, why do the bad thoughts and desires come in the mind? Because of the bad impressions that have been put over there. So based on our own samskaras from the past, either in this life or in the previous life. So those samskaras are there and that's why those bad thoughts are coming. Just like I said, give the, give the phone example. Why is Bollywood.com coming as autocomplete? Because we have visited Bollywood.com in that phone. So now we may say, oh, I have not thought about these things or I don't want to think about it. That's okay. But we have thought about it sometime maybe before we remember it. Now we can say even before we remember it, now our values have changed to some extent. So earlier, maybe we were looking for more and more sensual images because we thought it was enjoyable. So now we put all those images in our mind. That's why those images keep popping up. But now when we put new images, we create new impressions, and those old images will stop keeping. Will decrease and gradually will stop. These thoughts come from the mind or from the soul? No, the propositions come from the mind. See, the capacity for thinking, the capacity of consciousness comes from the soul. The specific thoughts that pop up, they come from the mind. So, the word thought has two different meanings. I just got a thought. I have given this a lot of thought. So thought can refer to like a spontaneous event that happens inside. I just got a thought. It's like a mental pop-up. So this is coming from the mind. Now I have given this a lot of thought. That is conscious contemplation. So that is something we can choose to do. Like many notifications may pop up on my device. I can decide which to click. So if you are using the word thought as a spontaneous event happening, a thought will grow into desire, all that. That spontaneous event that comes from the mind. But which thought we focus on, that is it's up to us. So you can say the role of intelligence, a wise person, what is it? Understand that? Not every thought deserves thought. That means not every notification deserves to be noticed. Not every pop-up requires our attention. Thank you. Yes, please. Prabhuji, you had mentioned uh, 
virtues and values uh, we discussed that there were 20 values but what is the difference between virtues and values like exactly no the, see i said i gave the example that what is valuable and what feels valuable so if there's a great mismatch between them then what that be the person has bad values see when you say this person has no values well nobody can live with no values when we say this person has no values that means they have no good values that means somebody robs from someone that means they value money so much that they don't value ethics they don't value decency they don't value they don't value say the order of law whatever it is so virtues are basically good values now all values don't have to be good some somebody can have bad values so when we say value education that means everybody has some values but we need to educate their values so that their values become virtues okay. yes please a uh, real knowledge is which uh, which take take us closer to the krishna and uh, and today's the science is its purpose is to uh, take the power to take the control of controlling uh so my question is how the science how the science should work how the technology should work in order to uh, like uh, how it should uh, what should be its purpose what should be its motive what there is nothing wrong in wanting to control the world it is say when we say arjuna is a great archer what does it mean he has precise control over his arms he has precise control over his grip he has precise control over the movement of the strings so that the arrow that is shot goes towards the target exactly so so controlling is not bad but why we are controlling that is the key thing in one sense when we say tad pranipati na paripashtina sevaya that surrender to a guru what does that mean the guru is becoming a controller isn't it and we are surrendering to the control of the guru but the guru should be a controller in the service of the supreme control so controlling is not the problem it is why we are controlling the problem so science can give us some control but what is happening is this controlling is not used generally in the service of supreme control this controlling is used to reject the idea of the supreme control that we will just we will understand the mechanism by the universe works and then after that there is no need for god the whole universe when i say the whole universe can be explained on one equation that can be written on your t-shirt that was their promise they are not able to come up with a great that, that what is that the gut grand unified theory or theory of everything whatever it is but the point is so that is it's controlling is a matter of expertise and that doesn't have to be bad that can be good if controlling is used for service of the supreme controller so then the more control we have the better we can serve krishna okay. yes last question two questions last question six please as krishna mentioned in the second chapter third chapter i don't remember exactly uh, he compared that sankhya yoga and devotional service are equivalent if someone is separating it they are not not that much intelligent so how to understand it okay so the fourth chapter no fifth chapter it is sankhya yoga putak bala pravinti rapita ekam apyasita samya bhayo vinda devana so what he say basically both of them have the same purpose and both of them are ultimately talking about liberation of the material world mm-hmm. so sometimes in life we have to focus on the differences sometimes we have to focus on the similarities so at that particular time in the fifth chapter we'll be discussing it tomorrow morning we'll see why specifically krishna is focusing on the similarities so in process they are different but in purpose they are ultimately similar prabhu uh, ji initially you have talked about like there is gita knowledge and there is pre gita knowledge yeah. so arjuna was from spiritual, a spiritual background he knew about soul karma so did you also knew that uh, where did the soul why did the soul came to this body or why did he came to material world 
are these questions were answered back then? Like, so generally, when we are in the domain of time, what is beyond the domain of time is difficult to understand. And this doesn't seem to have been uh, in any way a significant <coughs> question in the past. There are some references here and there uh, which may point to a particular way and that there can be various ways that can be seen uh, that particular question. But it does seem that uh, the existence of the soul in this world is like a given. It is there now, why, what do we do about it? So, it seems that uh, only in the Gaudiya tradition, from the time of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, uh, where the soul came from, that became a part of the discussion. And that possibly could have been because Christians have the idea of the fall. And they are trying to they say, what is our idea of where we came from? That was that's so that ex, that idea of explaining it in some way came up, but it seems that in the original texts, this issue itself doesn't come up much. The soul is here; that's a given. The soul has to get out of here. How exactly it came here? At the, in this particular chapter itself, in thirteen nineteen, I think thirteen twenty, which that is vidya nadi ubhavapi prakritim purusham chayiva. Vidya Anadi Ubhav, 1320. So the commentators, Chakravati Pad and others, they explain that Prakriti and Purusha, they are both Anadi, that is matter and spirit, they have no beginning, and their bond also has no beginning. So now Anadi, it means beginningless. So now is it literal that the soul has been eternally here, or is it non-literal, where it has been here for so long that we don't know then we just can't figure out how long it is. That's 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 not very clearly stated. So generally, this tradition, this question has not been an emphasis of the tradition much. So online, online, okay. Can you actually are reading online also? I think immediately we can ask. Um, okay. This question is from Dhruva Prabhu. Roji, can you please explain the difference between the approaches of a Bhakta and the Buddhist? Buddhists want to be desireless for happiness and Bhakta want to redirect their desire for happiness. So how can Buddhists say that becoming desireless can bring happiness? See, it's like when you want me to answer the question, you want me to answer the question and refute the answer also, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, <laughs> okay. Mm. To whatever little extent I have studied Buddhism, I studied comparative religions little bit only, not much. See, the Buddhist idea is that asha uh, hi paramam dukham nirasha paramam sukham. So that uh, desire is the cause of distress. And if you become free from desire, then you become free from distress. So now it's different Buddhism also, any philosophy that has existed for many centuries. Now it doesn't stay one philosophy, different philosopher, it doesn't stay one clear philosophy. There are different schools within them also and they have different interpretations of things. But generally, their idea broadly is that the purpose of life is not happiness. Their idea, like I said, existence beyond existence and non-existence. So they say that the, there is an experience beyond happiness and distress. And that is a state of what they call as nirvana. So their, their idea is that happiness the more we are seeking happiness, the more we will get distress, which is true at the material level. But because they don't have a very clear idea of the spiritual level, they just say that we have to go beyond both. Now many Buddhist practices, they bring people to sattva. And that itself is very pacifying for people. 
So it said, do Buddhists seek happiness? Or at least, no, everybody seeks happiness at a practical level. But at a philosophical level, as far as I understand, the Buddhists say that it is not that we want happiness. We want freedom from desire, which is the source, which is the cause of distress. And because distress and happiness come like one pack, when you become free from desire, you become free from this duality, and then there is an existence beyond happiness and distress. Now, the Vaishnava understanding, the Bhakti understanding is that, yes, there is a desire. There is an existence beyond material happiness and material distress. But that is, we enter into that based on spiritual desires. Okay. So, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gaurabhatta Vrindha Ki Jai. Thank you.